Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the very best NCLEX review business in the entire universe, in my opinion. Go to clinicreviews.com to sign up for our online on-demand review, or you can come to see us live in person in Ohio or in California. I would love to see you for three days in California. It's a phenomenal review. There's nothing like it. Okay. Uh, thank you to all of our channel members. You're awesome. We're over 200 members, so that's very cool that we have that many members. And if you want to pay me for something, you can go to clinicreviews.com and sign up for my next gen small group tutoring. And that's about it. So today we're doing musculoskeletal trauma questions. Uh, nothing particularly magical about the questions today, except that I did try to pick questions that are both informative and good for testing strategies and using common sense, y'all. Common sense is critical. All right, let's get started. A client undergoes a surgical amputation of a lower extremity after a motor vehicle crash. The client's vital signs are stable. What is a priority nursing action in the early postoperative period to help prevent complications in this client? Fitting the client with a prosthetic device, inspecting the limb stump daily for signs of skin breakdown, positioning and range of motion of the expect affected extremity, teaching the client and family how to apply shrinker stockings. Okay. Client undergoes a surgical amputation of a lower extremity. So they've had a lower extremity amputation. The client's vital signs are stable. What is a priority nursing action in the early post-operative period to help prevent complications in this client? So the keywords here are early post-operative period and prevent complications. Okay. So those are the key words, whatever they tell you, the time frame of when you're What's going on here? Pay attention to that. Okay, so it's early post-op. So they just had the amputation probably yesterday, two days ago. It's early post-op. So in order, so I'm going to turn this into a true-false statement, see what I think about that. So it is true that fitting the client with a prosthetic device in the early post-op period would help prevent complications. No, that's not true. We don't fit prosthetic devices early. You have to let the swelling go down. A lot of times it's six months or longer before they can get fitted for their final prosthetic device. So no. Okay. So inspecting the limb stump daily for signs of skin breakdown in the early post-op period will prevent complications. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, usually we look at the stump for skin breakdowns when they're wearing a prosthesis because we want to make sure it's not rubbing at the wrong place. So since they're not wearing a prosthesis yet, I'm not sure that B is a good idea or is, I'm, I'm sorry, not, it's not, it's not a good idea, but, uh, I don't know that it would prevent complications at this time, which is the early post-op period. But I'm going to leave it on the list as the question mark. If there's nothing else that makes any sense, we can come back to it. Positioning a range of motion of the affected extremity in the early post-op period would help prevent complications in this client. Okay, if you don't know this, positioning in the early post-op period after an amputation is critically important so they don't get uh, contracted because if they get contracted, then they can't fit a prosthesis successfully. So C is a really good option. So I'm going to leave that on the list. Teaching the client and family how to apply the shrinker stockings in the early post-op period would help prevent complications. So we don't apply shrinker stockings in the early post-op period. <clears throat> so the only one that makes any sense in the early post-op period, y'all, is C. And if you didn't know that, then positioning is critical in the post early post-op period and range of motion so that they have good range of motion and they haven't developed any contractures and they can fit the prosthesis later. So the key word in this is early post-op period. So pay attention to that. I've always said, and most of the videos that I do, you have to figure out what the keywords in the question are, okay? And I try to help you figure that out as we go through the questions. A client has a grade three open fracture of the right tibia. To prevent infection, which intervention does the nurse implement? Apply bacitracin ointment to the site daily with a sterile cotton swab. Use strict aseptic technique when cleaning the site. C, leave the site open to air to keep it dry. D, assist the client to shower daily and pat the wound site dry. Okay, let's read the question again. A client has a grade three open fracture of the right tibia. So I don't know what a grade three is, but I know an open fracture means it's open. So the bone is open, okay? To prevent infection, which intervention does the nurse implement? So I do know musculoskeletal bone, specifically bone. 
uh, skeletal is I really don't want to get a bone infection because that is very, very difficult to treat. They can be on antibiotics for months and months, sometimes years, if you get a bone infection. And so to prevent infection, which is a bit, a bit, and it actually says that there. Oh gosh, Sharon, it says it right there. Okay. That's a keyword to prevent infection. So let's see. So I would apply bacitracin to an open fracture to prevent infection with a sterile concept. I'm not going to apply bacitracin to an open fracture, y'all. Absolutely not. Please don't tell me you would do that. I would use strict aseptic technique when cleaning the site of an open fracture to prevent infection. Absolutely. If you don't know what aseptic means, aseptic means sterile. Aseptic means sterile. And that seems like a really good idea when I have an open bone fracture. See, in order to prevent infection at an open, uh, I would leave the site of an open fracture open to air. Uh, no, not to prevent infection. Uh, in order to prevent infraction, infection of an open fracture, I would assist the client to shower daily and pat the wound site dry. Absolutely not. Y'all, we got an open fracture there. No, 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 no. So we're going to use strict aseptic technique when cleaning the site. So what I want you to get in the habit of doing, and you have to be intentional about this, is you have to relate the answers back to the question. If the answer can't be related back to the question, don't pick it. Or if it doesn't make any sense when you relate it back to the question, don't pick it. Okay. I mean, there's some wounds that we can assist them to, to take a shower and pat the wound dry. There's some wounds that we can, but not an open bone fracture, y'all. Okay. See, the nurse, or three, the nurse is instructing a local community group about ways to reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. What information does the nurse include in the teaching plan? Wear helmets when riding a motorcycle, avoid contact sports, avoid rigorous ec exercise, avoid driving in inclement weather. All right, let's read the question again. The nurse is instructing a local community group about ways to reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. What information does the nurse include in the teaching plan? Okay, so let's relate every answer back to the question. Wearing helmets when riding a motorcycle would reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. True. Okay, keep that on the list. Avoiding contact sports would reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. True. Avoiding rigorous exercise would reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. True. Avoid driving inclement weather would reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. Mm, I mean, yeah, but that, I don't see that as a legitimate option. Like D just doesn't make any sense to me. Like you're not going to tell people to avoid driving in inclement weather to avoid a musculoskeletal injury. So I'm going to cross off D. Okay. So the reason I want to do this one is this is a higher level question, y'all. This is a high level. This is an uh, at least application, possibly analysis because you have three right answers. And what you have to use do is use clinical reasoning to decide what is the best of the three right answers. Because all of them, all three, will reduce the risk for musculoskeletal injury. But we're teaching this in the community. So we have people of all ages, um, all abilities, right? So do we want to, so when I'm teaching the community, do I want to teach people in the community to avoid rigorous exercise? Does that make sense that I teach people in the community to avoid rigorous exercise? That doesn't make sense to me that I would teach everybody in the community to do that. Would I teach everybody in the community to avoid contact sports? That does not seem like it makes sense to me. To some people, maybe, but not everybody. I'm teaching the community group. Would I teach everybody in the community to wear helmets when riding a motorcycle? Yes. It doesn't matter who you are, what age you are. It doesn't matter. You're going to, you, we're going to teach everybody to wear a helmet when riding a motorcycle. So when you get a question like this, you relate all the answers back to the, all the answers back to the question and you go, well, they all apply. They're all true. Then you say, okay, let me use my common sense and see which makes the most common sense in this situation. Use your common sense, y'all. You have you cannot throw your common sense out the window. Uh, common sense is the foundation of good nursing practice. Okay, I I've said this before. Don't tell anybody I said this. This is the secret just amongst us nurses. Okay, don't tell anybody I said this. Nursing is not rocket science. It's not. It's common sense. It's got some science, but it's not rocket science. Y'all's common sense with a little science, a little bit of common sense, uh, a little bit of love, uh, a little bit of compassion, right? All those things mixed together, but the common sense is like the foundation of it. All right, five, a client sustains a fracture of one arm 
and the provider applies a plaster cast to the extremity. So that would be closed reduction, right? They just realigned it and then put a cast on it. They don't say they did closed reduction, but that's what happens when you do a plaster cast. What will the nurse teach the client to do during the first 24 hours after discharge from the emergency department? Okay, so the keyword is cast and 24 hours after discharge. Those are the keywords. Monitor neuromuscular status for decreased circulation and sensation in the extremity. Apply a heating pad for 15 to 20 minutes, four times daily to help with the pain. Check the fit of the cast by inserting a tongue blade between the cast and the skin. Keep the cast covered with a soft towel to help it to dry quickly. All right, y'all, this is not a difficult question. This is an understanding question. It's not high level, but y'all got to know this. This is fundamental cast care. It, maybe you're all like, I know fundamental cast care, Dr. Sharon. That's cool. So like fast forward through this. But if you don't know this, you never stick anything up the cast. <laughs> never. Don't put a heating pad on it. Ice is okay, but not a heating pad. And it's got to dry, so don't be covering up in the first 24 hours. You got to let it dry, okay? All right, six. A client is in skeletal traction. Which nursing intervention ensures proper care of this client? Ensures that weights, ensure that weights are placed on the floor. Ensure that pins are not loose and tighten as needed. Inspect the skin at least every eight hours. Remove the traction weights only for bathing. A client is in skeletal traction. Which nursing intervention ensures proper care of this client. Okay. If you don't know what skeletal traction is, you could get a skeletal traction question on the NCLEX. Skeletal traction is when they have, essentially they have pins in the bone and they're realigning it through the weight. So let's say they have a, uh, some kind of a femur fracture and they have pins in there and they're laying on their back and the, the pins that are attached, that are attached to the bone actually have weights hanging off the end of the bed and it's pulling on it so that it straightens the leg. So I don't know how much we do skeletal traction anymore. It's not the same as external fixation. External fixation is where they go in and realign the bone. They fixate it with the metal. They go home and they've got this fixator on their arm or whatever. And then they, one day, like six weeks later, they go in and have the fixator removed and they're heal, they're better, right? Skeletal traction is weight-based. It has weights that's pulling on it to straighten it. There's no fixators there. The fixators are not, are not straightening anything. The fixators are there to attach to the weights and the weights pull the extremity. So you're not getting out of bed and walking, y'all. There's no walking when you're in skeletal traction. So skin care is really important. But the whole point of skeletal traction is that you have weights hanging off of it. So you don't take the weights off. Like you don't go, oh, well, we'll just take the weights off for a little while. No, no, don't do it. You don't take the weights off. They could be in skeletal traction with the weights for like, I think it could be like a month or more. You, the weights are hanging. You, don't put the weights on the floor. It takes the, all the weight off of it, right? You got to have the weight hanging so that it can straighten things up. So they're in skeletal traction. So what do we have to do? Ensure the weights are placed on the floor. Absolutely not. It's taking all the weight off. Don't do it. Ensure that pins are not loose and tighten as needed. We don't loosen and tighten the pins. There's no loosening and tightening of the pins. <laughs> okay. Expect the skin at least every eight hours. Well, that's okay. Remove the traction weights only for bathing. Don't remove the traction weights without a doctor's order. Don't do it. Um, now expect the skin every eight hours. You might go, well, every eight hours, that's not often enough. Well, skeletal traction is not a critical care intervention. It's a, it's a med surge, musculoskeletal inter intervention. Every eight hours assessments are fine. Okay. Turning them is going to be every two hours, right? There's going to be some kind of turn schedule. You're probably gonna have special turning stuff so you can turn this person with weights. I, I can't even imagine how you do it, but you still got to turn them every two hours but you don't, ha you only have to inspect the skin. And I'm talking about like around the pins and everything that's every eight hours. Okay. All right. Seven, the nurse performs a neurovascular assessment on a client with closed multiple fractures of the right humerus. Why this is a long question. Closed multiple fractures of the right humerus who is experiencing increased pain, even with maximum ordered doses of morphine. The nurse notes distal capillary refill of three seconds and coolness of the hand and fingers. The client reports numbness of the hand and is unable to wiggle the thumb, which nursing action is needed. Elevate the extremity, apply an ice pack to the extremity, reposition the extremity and recheck in 15 to 20 minutes or notify the provider of these findings. So we've got a fractured humerus. So that's the arm. The pain is increased, even though it's getting maximum doses of pain medicine poor capillary refill, coolness of the hand and fingers. So pain, poikilothermia, 
paralysis. Uh, numbness is paresthesia. That's four. That's four out of the six. So when it's a it's a medical emergency when you have all six for an extremity: pallor, pulselessness, poikilothermia, which is coolness. Poikilothermia doesn't mean coolness. They use it just so they have another P. But you that's it's supposed to refer to cooling coolness of the, the of the extremity. Paresthesia, which is um, uh, numbness and tingling, paralysis, can't move it, and then pain. So those are the six things. If you're if you're patient has all six in a hand or foot or extremity, that's a medical emergency. Now you go, well, they don't have all four. They've only got pal, they've got pallor, they've got poikilothermia, they got paresthesia, they got paralysis, and they well, they've got five. <laughs> okay, we've got five. So when you've got five of the six, what do you think you should do? Elevate the extremity? Well, they already have pain, so I don't think that's going to help. Apply ice while well, it's already cool. I don't think that's going to help. Reposition the extremity, recheck in 15 to 20 minutes. Y'all, they've got five out of the six. They could lose that extremity. They don't have any circulation to it. Notify the provider. I think that sounds like a good idea. Sounds like a good idea, y'all. Um, that's it. So I hope that helped you. It helped me. I learned something. All right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll see you later. Bye.